Well, the haters gonna hate, 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 and the fakers gonna fake, 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 baby. I'm just gonna make, 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 making luck, making luck. A demanding podcast. Once you start bleeding from the head, you should usually stop whatever it is you're doing. I'm willing to die on that cross. <laughs> so if you're playing Dominion and you're and head starts bleeding yeah. you can pause right like you can say hey yeah, if you're playing the bot you can just yeah. pause and but if if you're playing a human opponent you should probably say in the chat hey I'm jsyk bleeding from the head bleeding from the head brb <laughs> brb uh, jklol like they've it's happened to them before too at some point yeah. you know or it will yeah um i mean you know. everyone is probably going to bleed from the head at some point in their lives yeah i mean that's probably true yeah. right like depends how long you live um, but at some point, you'll bleed from every part of your body, really. Yeah. Well. So, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was good. Yeah. Uh, welcome to Making Luck, uh, a Dominion podcast, where we talk about uh, a card game called Dominion and also bleeding. Um, <laughs> I am Jake, and as always, I am in Adam's basement. Adam. Hey. hey. How's my basement? <laughs> It's good. It's uh, it's nice and warm. It's starting to get cold here. Um, yeah. We had our first winter storm today. Oh yeah. Did yeah. you like almost die on the way here or something? Uh no no. But uh, well I don't know. I wasn't really paying attention. I was on Discord, so I might have almost died. It wasn't. <laughs> um, Were you wearing your seatbelt? <laughs> yeah, I do wear my seatbelt. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Uh, I remember on my way home from work today, the snow was starting to pick up, little slushies yeah. were on my windshield. It was, uh, it was a little scary, and I was thinking about, like, you know, maybe we should do this over Skype tonight, but, you know. No, man. Um, but you're here. Yeah. And I'm glad you are, because that makes my life a lot easier. Yeah, I would, uh, if, if I die, it is, uh, a small price to pay for... You not having to edit more pauses out of the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. It's really annoying. Yeah, I know. I can tell. So, <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're willing to make that sacrifice yeah, for the podcast. Yeah. And speaking of sacrifice... It was in the kingdom we played. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this episode, by the way, is going to be about Colony and uh, Dominate, and just uh, how those play into normal games of Dominion, how they're different, and how they're the same. Uh, but last episode was about Market Square. Yeah. It's uh, first blue card. Yeah, first blue card we covered. Yeah, and we, we had a kingdom with Market Square in it. We did, yeah. and, and we played that kingdom, and yeah. we're, we're going to talk about that. Yeah, it had sacrifice, too. It had sacrifice, so yeah. maybe we should read the rest of the cards. Yeah, go for it. All right, so this kingdom had a Monastery, Market Square, Trade Route, Hideout, Sacrifice, Courtier, Merchant Guild, Mystic, Puka, and Raider. And it also had the landmark Tomb and the Project Canal. Uh, and, of course, because we had Puka, we also had Cursed Gold. So, once more for our audio-only listeners, we had Monastery, Market Square, Trade Route, Hideout, Sacrifice, Courtier, Merchant Guild, Mystic, Puka, Raider, the landmark Tomb, and the Project Canal. So, because, as always, we have Puka, we had Curse Gold involved as well. Yeah, that, uh, that messed with the opening a touch, huh? Yeah, I forgot. Somehow, I think I forgot about it every single game. Yeah. Like, I think every single time we sat down with this, I was always expect. If I didn't draw it in my starting hand, I always got a different hand than I was expecting next. Because, like, I was just... There were undue requests. I'm still I'm still getting the hang of uh, Puka Curse Gold shenanigans and yeah. how that affects the open. Yeah, that's, that's a thing, for sure. Uh, I wanna I wanna start off by saying uh, there was there was something that I said uh, last podcast when talking about this kingdom. Oh yeah, I was yeah, corrected I many times on this, and I just want to make sure that the world knows <laughs> that I um, I had some trouble counting, <laughs> and uh, it showed. I said that if you play a hideout and a puka, that it's not draw because it doesn't increase your hand size. For the record, I didn't catch this either, but yeah, uh, and uh, that's just not true. I forgot that hideout draws you a card, so you. You play the hideout and the puka, that's two cards. You have to trash two cards from your hand. So you're paying four cards, but you draw five cards, the one from the hideout and the four for the puka. So you actually do increase your hand size. 
Yeah. Granted, which, you have to line up four things. Yeah, I mean, it matters, though. Like, yeah. these are... Yeah. Well, you don't. You only have to line up two things, because... Well, you really only have to line up three. You have to line out Hideout Puka and a treasure other than Cursed Gold, and then the fourth thing is something that you want to trash. So, yeah, but that fourth oh. thing is, like, everything on this kingdom. And, <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah, the we already. I mean, we knew right away that tomb was going to be pretty important here, uh, because there's just so many sources of trashing, and uh, Market Square, like we had hypothesized, is indeed great here. Um, yeah, super great. If you're going to trash 50 cards, you're going to need to gain some cards. Yeah. And Market Square will gain you cards because you can play it and get a buy, just buy a copper. That's fine. Or you can reveal it uh, and get a gold. And then maybe you can even draw it and play it for the buy again. You can gain lots of cards. In fact, all the other ways of gaining cards here are a lot less good. There's Courtier and there's Merchant Guild, and those just aren't nearly as good at gaining cards as Market Square is. Yeah. Now, you uh, sort of have these two... I mean, getting thin here is, like, trivial, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the And you, you have these two kind of decks that we were talking about building. They're doing very similar things, but it's kind of just how much of each thing you do. There is the Spin Your Wheels Forever deck, which is basically just getting a bunch of these components working together to trash a bunch of cards every turn and get tomb points. Uh, that is more effective than it sounds, actually. I, I didn't think it sounded <laughs> well, very good when it was described. All it does is spin its wheels and trash cards and basically rebuy the coppers that yeah, it trashed. That's and, all it does, and, really. And it picks up some more components. Uh, in the If things are going well, you also have a merchant guild involved, so you're getting coffers as you do it. And It's actually not bad, because you keep up in points. Like, you're getting three or four points a turn, at least, and... And that means your deck is not getting any worse. Your deck's not getting any worse. So, like, what's the alternative? And that's the other thing we're going to talk about is the uh, this deck that's going for provinces, basically, on the other side of the table. And uh, that deck is getting worse. So, if you can kind of keep up in points and have better end game position just by having a better deck and more buys and a big stack of coffers, you can uh, pretty reliably close out the game in your favor, even if you're a little behind in points throughout the rest of the game. So. So the, the Spin Your Wheels deck, uh, that's more, that's like a hideout puka thing at its core, and then you throw in a market square and probably a single merchant guild. And maybe yeah. you still have a monastery, but maybe you don't. You're not really doing double merchant guild or anything. That's just, yeah. not because you wouldn't want that, but because it's just like really hard to build a deck that could do it. Yeah, like the coffers just, they don't matter like quite we, as much. It doesn't really matter what you trash. Uh, you also probably don't want to get any more than one Merchant Guild as well. Yeah, I mean, we talked about how the only draw here is to line up three distinct cards, uh, and that comes together to increase your hand size by one non-terminally. So, like, it's kind of hard to get to the point where you're playing more than one Merchant Guild. The first mm -hmm. one's probably worth it just because you are spending all your buys every turn, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, because you it need really to rebuy those coppers that you've been trashing at least <clears throat> yeah uh so yeah it's a big deal yeah and so the the dream deck here the of the the dream iteration of what we're talking about is this deck that like adam said is uh, at its core playing a bunch of hideouts and pukas and puke and uh it's also you know revealing the occasional market square to gain a gold um that's not necessary remember you have permission not to reveal market square it's okay uh and then it is hopefully playing a merchant guild possibly not but it is definitely wanting to play this was surprising a raider to me i was I just i wasn't surprised at all for the record i was surprised by this the raider was actually a ri so like for both of the decks we're going to talk about the yeah, raider was really, really important good it was so like the money was pretty good because you're you have a hard time drawing and playing treasures, uh, but well I guess you have to draw the raider too. But like that attack, it, it hurts a lot. Remember we said you have to line up three cards to draw one card. That really sucks to have to discard one card. And it's usually a good card too. Yeah, because you're you're so thin, you don't have to play those coppers. In fact, you probably don't. So like you're. Opponents discarding. You're usually they want. trashing all of the coppers on your turn. Actually, and even, like all of the golds, if you had any of those, they're also getting trashed. Well, and remember, we said you have to have something to trash your puka. If you have to discard a copper, that can destroy your turn as well. It's real bad. Yeah. yeah so, uh, yeah, the raider. 
You probably want two of those just so you can play at one every turn. At least two, yeah. yeah. Enough so that you can reliably play one every turn, for sure. Or have a decent shot at it. So so there's this other deck that... Um, I, I would say the main difference in the way it builds is uh, you don't put hideouts in it. You don't bother with villages. So um, I played a lot... I played around a lot with building for each of these decks. Uh, for this deck, I think I got it pretty well down. You open Puka Monastery no matter what your opening is. And then you pick up a second Monastery, and then you start picking up Market Squares. And you just try and get as thin as possible while flooding with goals as quickly as possible. Yeah. And then at some point, Puka stops being a very good card. Because uh, in this deck, I found that rebuying coppers just to trash them for more Tomb Points wasn't nearly as good as just having a bunch of golds. Well, the other thing, it didn't really play into the win condition of that deck, because remember that the, what he's talking about is flooding with golds, with Market Square, and basically playing uh, this deck that has gotten tomb points, but then kind of playing money after that, right? Well, you go for provinces, and yeah. you use golds to buy the provinces. So if you, you want to call that money, you go right ahead, man. Yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't like, need to draw the game out or anything and get points from Tomb. You're just trying to end the game with the provinces because you have a lead because you're getting provinces. Yeah, so the idea is that this uh, Spin Your Wheels deck is generating four points a turn on average. Yeah, and two to four, depending on how things go. Uh, I mean, you're going to have good turns, and then you're also going to have turns where you accomplish absolutely nothing, and maybe yeah. you'll have six of those turns in a row. Yeah. Maybe that'll happen. That's, yeah. Uh, but... The idea is that I'm going to try and gain six points a turn by putting a province in the deck and only having maybe one or two off turns once I flooded. And while I'm flooding with gold, I'm keeping up in points because Tomb, you know, I'm usually trashing almost as many cards, if not the same amount of cards. Things are going well. Yeah, so the we, we've talked about these two different decks that are doing some of the same stuff, but I'd call them different decks because they have different goals by the time we get to the mid to end game. For sure. And... If you have the question, which one of these was better, uh, I want to say that the Spin Your Wheels deck was pro is probably my favorite most often because it does have better uh, position and more reliability. Uh, well, okay, not more reliability. <laughs> it has the potential to do better stuff, which is just getting these increasing amounts of points and having the threat of grabbing provinces at the end to close it out. Uh, without losing too much of a lead and not making the deck really worse. But it is also catastrophically unreliable. That deck could have any number of dud turns at any time because it needs to line things up to kick off. And this other deck that uh, is just... Floods with gold and buys provinces. With gold, yeah, it may have a little bit less potential, but it's definitely getting its value. Uh, and the Raiders are slowing both one down equally, so I don't think the Raiders factor in so much. Um, yeah, we played a lot of games. I think it really comes down to whoever drew better yeah, was going to win. And assuming the strategy, you're not playing like, that mirror. Well, actually, even if you are playing that mirror, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just think that the, the strategy didn't seem to be nearly as big of a factor as who got screwed more. This is true. Of course... That that is assuming that both people have built intelligently, right? Like, because if you <laughs> good luck with that. Yeah, no, I mean, if you if you get screwed, uh, but you were but your opponent just wasn't building one of these two decks we were talking about or wasn't doing it very well, uh, you're still gonna win. But like, assuming that both you and your opponent are playing their deck to the best of its ability, yeah, it's definitely it doesn't matter so much which deck you're trying to build as far as. Uh, as much as it does how your draws went. Right. Uh, so I think for the for the deck that goes for provinces, uh, it's pretty simple. There aren't really that many cards that go into it. It's mostly Puka, Monastery, Market Square. Yeah. I would add in, and a bunch of raiders, of course. I would add in maybe a Merchant Guild and a Courtier yeah. later on if I hit five. I would say those, those tended not to come up very often, though, right? I would get one, if any. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're they're decent cards for the deck, but sometimes you just don't get them. As far as the Spin Your Wheels deck, I think most of the same cards are there, except uh, you throw some hideouts in and more Pukas, and then you're not getting a courtier. 
Yeah, we both tried opening Sacrifice for a while, and I think we yeah. decided that I, I was just a lot better. Yeah, I advocated for that last time. I think I did Sacrifice too. is just not a good card. Now, part of that was predicated on the idea that, oh, well, you have to sacrifice an action in order to draw cards, and uh, obviously that's not true. So maybe if I was better at counting, I wouldn't have advocated for it. But yeah, Hideout's just a fine opener here. Like, if I'm yeah. going for that deck, I want to open Hideout Monastery. The only real advantage that the Sacrifice has is that you can trash coppers to get two money, um, which mm, I'd kind of rather just have the extra action. And uh, other than that, it can it can trash the estates to get VP chips, but like... You'd really rather be trashing the estates with the monastery. Yeah. Because uh, it's like, not awful the, at trashing them. And the VP chips are definitely made up, eclipsed by tomb points. Right. Uh, so yeah, Monastery was a pretty actually key part of this kingdom because... Uh, it makes it so you can play your Cursed Gold. Yeah, norm a lot of the time, I think, we both think that people are a little too liberal playing their Cursed Golds uh, when, just because you can trash the Curses. Because like, just because you can trash the Curses doesn't mean you want the Curses, right? Yeah, um, I, I'm almost, like, this sounds a little crazy... But I kind of think that you need to keep your curse gold around, and you need to play it just so you can get the curses, just so you have more things to trash. Here, now, here, that sounds yes. terrible. Yeah, on this, game, I think that sounds terrible. It felt fine. It when we might were doing be it. terrible, but I think that's what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, I think regardless of your strategy, just having those extra gains, yeah. having extra cards to trash, it doesn't really hurt your tempo that much. You got to be playing your hideouts, and you got to have stuff to reveal in your market squares and stuff like that. Yeah, your trashers—they need food. Yeah. So uh, all in all, I will say I actually did kind of like this kingdom quite a bit. Just I mean, because you swore a lot when we were playing it. I swear a lot every <laughs> board, uh, but yeah, like, okay, that's fair I point. did. I did actually enjoy this uh, this kingdom. Um, you, I like the idea of just being able to build this uh, deck that has these. Consistent inputs and outputs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I gotta say that this is this is exactly the kind of thing that makes me love empires and landmarks in particular, because like this deck would be awful on on any board because it oh, doesn't totally. actually do anything except spin except its wheels and accomplish get, nothing. But it gets tomb points. But because of tomb, yeah. <laughs> you can build this deck and have it be good, and that's Dominion. <laughs> this is now part of Dominion. Uh, what do you think about Kamel here? <laughs> I think you, I, I think you get it. I mean, you're buying a lot of cards in both strats, and yeah. uh, at the end of it, I was convinced that you get it. Like, you hit seven, sometimes you hit even more. I think I got an $18 Canal once in nice. one game. Nice, nice. I've always wanted to try that. So, yeah. yeah. $18 Canal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that was this kingdom. Um, it's kind of hard to say a whole lot about it other in terms of what was definitively best, because uh, none of it was very good. Yeah, uh, but yeah, so um, yep. definitely recommend trying the kingdom out. It's yeah, it was it was fun. Yeah, sweet. Well, uh, do you want to do you want to get into some uh, some of the more substantial part of the podcast? Yeah. So if you were gonna make a lunch meat joke here, it would just be about how big it was. Yeah. I'm sorry I said that. It's, but, it's too bad we're not um, making a lunch meat joke. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I said that, but basically, again, <laughs> uh, we're talking about Colony and Dominate, and originally when we were outlining this, it was just going to be about Colony, but we've had Dominate on our list for a while, and a lot of the things that you can say, not all of them, but a lot of them that you can say about Colony and what it does to the game, uh, Dominate does as well. This is just this extra bigger stack of vp that's uh, more expensive than province and gets you more points but it's still got province around that could end the game for sure so i think uh, uh i mean colony uh, it's from the prosperity expansion yeah it's a victory card costs 11 gives you 10 points yeah neato and whenever you have colony you also have platinum it's a treasure card it's worth five and it costs nine yeah, and uh, colonies end the game when they deplete, like provinces do. Key thing here is that provinces are still in the game, and if they run out, the game also ends. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's an additional endgame condition. Yeah, so it's pretty neat. 
Yeah, so like it's the it's this bigger game of Dominion that you were talking about, yeah. Yeah, so in a lot of ways there's this idea that games, uh, when you're comparing province games to colony games, and when I say colony games, I just mean games that have colony. When I say provinces, I mean ones that don't. Yeah. Uh, when you're comparing the two, you look at these colony games as like bigger games of Dominion. They score higher, they tend to take a little longer in turns, the price points you're trying to get per hand are a little higher, so in a lot of ways... Uh, you just do the things that when you regular games of Dominion, you just do them more and bigger. -er. Yeah, so like I play regular games of Dominion all the time where I just buy uh, silvers and gold and then provinces. <laughs> so th that's a regular game of Dominion. No, I'm just trolling. Uh, I think what he means by regular game of yeah. Dominion is one where you would have gone for provinces, which is a yeah. lot of the time, right? Yes. But uh, that's relevant, right? Because a uh, colony is a bigger province, and if I was going to score points by, I don't know, spinning my wheels and getting 50 VP by trashing cards with Tomb, then colony is... Uh, it's a different thing than that. Yeah, I mean the when you when we talk about colony and the strategic insights you gain, remember that when you're looking at colony games, a lot of the things that when you uh, games of Dominion normally like knowing when to build and when to start greening are still in effect. They're just on a bigger scale. Yeah, so you know you say build more and the game takes a little longer. Yeah, a lot of people um, when I first started playing, uh, I felt this way too feel that uh, Colony was just the the more the fuller Dominion experience. Like, now that I have these Colony and Platinum cards, we can play the full game of Dominion. Yes. And and it's... we will just put these in every single kingdom because now we're playing we're playing Grown Ups Dominion. Yeah, there we go. No, it's just it's different. Like, it's... it's like my gaming group that's like they really <laughs> want to play Battlestar Galactica. And I'm like, why would you play that game? It takes two to four hours when you could just play Resistance, which is, they call it Avalon now, they reskinned it. It's the same game, it's a hidden traitor, hidden loyalty game, but it takes 10 minutes, and they're like, well, we just want to put the chrome on it, which is a Cylon joke, right? So if you're into Battlestar, good for you. Yeah, it's just like colonies that way. It's, so it's just so like colonies. The, uh, basically, <laughs> the other thing you should bear in mind about these colony games is that they will tend to steer you away from money strategies. And that kind of comes with uh, a game being, like, uh, just bigger in general because uh, you know a lot of the the big ally of the money strategy is the game ending because as uh, is the game end so as uh, we've talked about before on various means in the making luck family of media um, <laughs> the uh, the money is basically trying to win by front running uh, it's yeah. basically trying to get this lead and then keep it and then being aided by the fact that the game is going to end before a deck that's building to do more can catch up. But in these colony games, uh, remember that you have to uh, build a little more because the game is just going to take longer. Your goal is strictly uh, strictly harder in a colony game, so these but, money strategies are going to be more difficult to have succeed. But Jake, I can still play money and still buy provinces and still end the game exactly the same! This is true, but... Your opponent's gonna have more points. Yeah, so there's there's um, two <laughs> factors here. There's there's two factors. Yeah. The first one is big money or any money strategy. I'm I apologize for saying big money. Any any strategy that's sure. aiming to play treasures and buy provinces or maybe colonies in this case is uh it, it has an, a win condition that is get half of the available VP. Yeah. Sometimes that's how you win. Sometimes you get to six provinces and you're like, oh, I can get three duchies and then I'll have half of the VP or, or something like that. Or sometimes you just have six and then you just get the other two or whatever right um, so so either so in the case where i wanted to get the duchies that is no longer going to work for me yeah. because someone playing something else has 80 vp that's there that they can get and that's a lot more than anything i'm going to get without stinking colonies so that right. option is just gonzo that whole 50 percent vp limp across the finish line that's just not there yeah for, for a deck that wants to do that and whereas the other thing about playing a money-centric strategy on a colony board is your position is a little more precarious because if you do start to lose your front-running lead, if you're playing like a province game, you can backpedal and get duchies and kind of catch up, whereas uh, the uh, the... It's a little bit harder to do that with the colonies because you're, you're quote-unquote duchies or provinces instead, and they're just harder to buy. Uh, sure. 
um, I, I was gonna I was gonna make this point that like let's say I want to get six provinces and yeah. and there's some other bigger deck that's being built and you know now they have this great deck but I have six provinces yeah. and in order for them to catch up to me in points they have to get like all eight duchies right sure and that's a pain in the tuchus like that's hard to do yeah and it also makes their deck really bad. So after they get these duchies, you know, they're going to have to continue attacking me or whatever to slow me down so I don't get another province, or they're going to have to they're going to have to draw all this stuff with eight duchies in their deck and then like get the last provinces somehow. Good yes. luck with that. That's really tough to do. And so now if I'm going to play this same kind of a strategy with colonies out, they don't have to jump through those hoops, right? So it's not about getting 50% VP, but like limiting options for them to catch up. And overtake me in points. And this is true for any pile of VP yeah. or any alternate source of points. It will support a strategy that wants to build longer because they get more options this way. Colony is an extreme example of that. That's definitely the case. Yeah, and that's a good way of putting it. Uh, the other thing that really uh, plays to Colony encouraging you to build more is that it's a little easier to quote-unquote catch up in a Colony game. In a, if your main source of points is provinces... Uh, then your supplementary source is, is duchies, and you buy two of those, and it equals one province, and that's like assuming that you took your turn to buy two of them. Uh, if you if your main source of points is colonies, and your quote unquote duchies are provinces, well, you get two of those, and that exceeds uh, one colony. So losing out on a colony uh, tends not to be as big of a deal as losing out on provinces when provinces are the crux. Now, yeah, you're probably thinking correctly right now. Well, yes, yeah, but correctly. There province... is a correct way to think. No, this is the correct thing because provinces are more expensive than duchies. That's correct. Oh, um, and good so call. Good, getting good correct thinking. Having listener. having the two of those is harder <laughs> than having a double duchy turn or a province game. And you're right. But basically, what we're getting at here <laughs> is again, these colony platinum games are just telling you to build more in many ways. A lot of the advantages that a, a money strategy that's rushing to the end would have, it doesn't have those anymore. Yeah, like even if they want to get colonies, like it's still there's still more points out there for them to catch up. And yeah, as, as Jake said, the provinces are better for that purpose. If the the faster front running strategy goes for colonies, then yeah. duchies would be if colonies weren't out and the front runner was going for provinces. Yeah, and when we're talking about building more, we're getting we're talking about getting to this point where you're drawing and having enough buys and payload to do that. You know? Yeah, usually I when I think in this case building more just is aiming for higher payload turns, which typically means investing in more deck control. Yeah. That's yeah. a very abstract way of putting it, but you know, there's no kingdom in front of us. So now, that's what we got. Uh, we we wanted to get through the, the in through that point first because that talks about these ways that these uh, do kind of just function as bigger games of Dominion and uh, we're going to talk about some ways where it doesn't too. Like we talked about how you get rewarded for building more and getting this better deck. Well, the rest of the game is kind of telling you that as well, for the most part. Uh, the uh, but now we can also talk about colony games and how the number scaling affects things that make them characteristically different from games without colony. There there are some uh, things that are uh, qualities of a colony game uh, strategic qualities that make them a little bit different than playing to a regular province game. I have no idea what you mean by that. Good, good. <laughs> All right, so... Really uh, not. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, the first one I want to get to is basically just in a colony game, uh, trashing your coppers is a little bit better. Oh, Obviously, yeah. you want to be trashing your coppers a lot of the time in a regular game, too, but... A lot of the time, it's a pretty low priority, and if the Copper Trasher is really bad, like, uh, you've your only options are, like, uh, Miser or Stonemason or Trade Route to trash your Coppers, and you could maybe uh, get by without trashing them, you just kind of elect not to do it. Whereas in a Colony game, uh, even if the Copper Trashing is terrible and you're on the fence, you kind of lean toward trashing the Coppers just because it's so much more important to get them out of the deck. Yeah, I remember um, back in the back in the day uh, when an Isotropic was around, and I was playing a lot of big money because that's yeah. what all the cool kids were doing. Right. Uh, you would play a lot of big money decks and find the enablers. And uh, Money Lender, I think, is a great example of this. Sure. Because uh, let's assume that you know you just get this one Money Lender, you never collide it with another terminal, it always finds a copper. So this is basically 
no opportunity cost. Yeah. You you know, you would just get it instead of a silver, but now you're thinning these coppers. And is that good for, for big money and without colonies and just a province game? It really doesn't make any difference at all. Yeah. Like, if the game is going to be just over... just big money, you don't really care about thinning coppers yeah, too much. If the, if the game is going to be over by the time you're worried about lining up a money lender with a copper, then... It, it really doesn't matter. Like, it affects the win rate so negligibly that, like, it doesn't really make any difference. And so if there's any opportunity cost greater than zero for yeah. trashing your coppers and all you're doing is playing money, well, then don't bother. Because, yeah, the coppers are bad, but, right. like, they're not so bad that it's worth it to go out of your way to trash them. And that's in a province game that we're talking yeah. about. Now, I think, and that uh, changes completely in calling games. Wandering Winder in his episode that he did for us on money density, uh, and he talked about what the impact of trashing a copper actually is in a money deck, mm. and he talks about uh, the how it does give you a negligible increase to your money density when you trash a copper, but that money that uh, increase is derived from the difference between the copper, which gives you money, and this other card, which gives you more money. Uh, so that the difference that you get from trashing a copper is that you're drawing a silver so you have one more dollar. That's a much, much bigger increase when you could be drawing a platinum instead. So like <laughs> when, you're, when your money density is being comprised of just these individual cards that have more money on them, trashing the coppers is better for money density proportionately than it is when you are talking about a province game and you're maybe getting a gold instead. Yeah, so like silver, gold versus platinum, you know, that's an extreme example, but really you're just calculating the money density. Yeah. And since you're building more in a game where you want to hit 11 and you have platinum to help you do so, then the card that you expect to draw is on average going to be better and so that's that's the the mathematical foundation of like oh that's why this matters more because the card I would be drawing is now better and so the the value of doing that instead of drawing this stupid copper that nobody likes is higher. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, the other thing is that these other kingdom treasures, that uh, they get a little bit worse in colony games. Now, I'm not saying they get bad, I'm saying they get worse. And I'm talking about silver mostly and also gold. Um, so, notably, uh, silver flooding gets worse. Silver flooding isn't great in a regular game of Dominion. Yeah, that's like just, it wasn't great to begin that's with. That's just uh, mindlessly gaining as much silver as you can get your hands on. But. I think that was really only good in a province game when, like, either you can thin your coppers and yeah. then flood with silvers and have, like, not have that not take forever. So somehow that happened. Or, like, you wanted to do something with the silvers, like, go to Fatem or Gardens or something. Yeah. Yes, like that. Something like that. The, the thing that I want to bring up is that you uh, think about these extreme examples uh, that are just illustrative. You draw this hand of five silvers. And that can buy that hand can buy a province. So if your goal is to buy yeah. a province, uh, silver is helping do its part for that. Because mm -hmm. if it you drawing one of the cards you would need, um, if you are uh, drawing a hand of five silvers, that does not, however, buy a colony. Now, realistically, even in a colony game, adding a silver to your deck is still going to improve your money density. You're not going to get to yeah. a point where you have two dollars per card or greater. It's it's very yes. rare to do that. That's that's really really important. Because, like, it's yeah. going to be really hard for me to add so many silvers to a deck that wants to buy Colony that I am hurting my cause. Because yeah. even but if I am hurting my cause, doesn't happen. Yeah. like, how could I be hurting it by all that much? Because I'm getting 10 elevenths of the way there with the silver. <laughs> like, right. how many silvers am I really going to need before this, is, this hurts me? You now, know? that's true. And it illustrates, I bring up that point of, like, drawing these five silvers as an unrealistic example um, that's not saying that the silvers are bad, it's just saying that they're worse. Uh, so the other really big aspect of colony games uh, would be that uh, the provinces still do end the game by emptying, as we alluded to. You think about the province, uh, a province game, you have these provinces which are the bulk of your points, but you have these other piles of points that uh, supplement your score but, but don't end the game. Uh, the supplementary score pile could end the game in a colony game, though, so it makes uh, playing around it a little weird. You have this option, really, kind of to sometimes ignore colonies uh, in, if you could end the game before they matter. Sure. I guess in this case, if you have decided uh, my win condition involves ending the game, so I, I'm, and I'm looking to end the game, 
and the amount of points I have while ending the game is going to be enough. I don't need to get 80 points. I'm fine with 40 points or whatever. So in this case, uh, you know, the provinces are easy to buy, so sure, go ahead and go for that. Uh, it's just, it's a little strange for me to imagine something like that because, you know, I, I guess my opponent would have to be building towards maybe like a mega turn deck that's going to yeah. score all of its points. You just have to cut them off before they can get there. Yeah, so we think about proven, about colonies being a quote-unquote better source of points than provinces, yeah. um, as in they're more efficient in terms of the amount of space they take up in your deck. Hmm. Uh, remember that that's... That's really only true. The The provinces are really only worse than the colonies if we're assuming the typical scoring rhythm of a game of Dominion, which is a gradual sort of uh, back-and-forth tug-of-war type scoring, where you're both, like, greening uh, as you're... You're both putting green cards in your deck at the same time. And you expect to draw those green cards. Uh, yeah, you know, at some point. Once, one or two or three times before the game's over. But, like Adam alluded to, if uh, the strategy is instead to score many points in quick succession and end the game over, like, a couple of turns, like a, a mega turn, or, uh, you know, even we could get into, like, uh, highways or governor is one that, like, is weird with colony because it can end the game oh, yeah. provinces really quickly. Yeah. Like, a lot of the time, it, the roles can kind of reverse. Like, the provinces might be your... your condition to end the game, yeah. and uh, the colonies might be supplementary scoring. Yeah, like, don't don't get distracted by the shiny colonies just because there are more points. Uh, you know, if, figure out how you can win the game, and Remember, if winning the game is ending the game soon, then, you know, aim to do that, stay focused. Yeah, like, I, uh, when I am playing a strategy that is getting colonies, but also wants to have a threat to end the game with Salt the Earth... I'm usually probably going to salt province over colony unless the colonies are already low because I, I know mm -hmm. that I can empty those provinces faster and, and make good on that threat that I'm making. Uh, that's that's an interesting case because really emptying a card from a pile is... I mean, it costs you four regardless. Sure. I mean, I guess there's a higher upside for like, oh, I'm if I manage to spike an eight, yeah. yeah, then I can buy this thing and have more points and then still empty the pile I care about. On the other hand, there's, there's the other idea that I'm taking a VP away from my opponent. That just seems like it'll never matter. Okay, I see, I see the point you're making. Yeah, sure. The point is that uh, provinces are easier to empty than colonies, so yeah. uh, as we've been reiterating, uh, if, you're, uh, if, if you are not so much trying to just end the game with more points, uh, or get more points than your opponent can get, but your goal is instead to just end the game on your terms, which has you having more points, the colonies are a less appealing pile than the provinces. Yeah. So, I, you know, we were talking about this mega turn thing, and, you know, that's one specific case. There are other ways uh, that in, you know, regular games of Dominion, as sure. we alluded to before, that I would find myself <coughs> thinking the way I win this game is by ending it quickly, right? And most of the time I'm thinking, like, my opponent's going for some source of VP that's not provinces, and I'm trying to pile the provinces. So, like, sure. vineyards or gardens or, or... Gardens is a little weird, but, yeah, you know, you Silk Road or something like that. Yeah, Silk Road, Feta, yeah. stuff like that. So, uh, I think in colony games, this tends to matter much less. Yeah, these other sources of VP that are not colonies just tend to get worse. Be and part of that is... I mean, I'd say most of that is just due to scale. Like, they just get outscaled by how many points the colonies are. Yeah, it's really hard to score 10 points with any single one of those cards that we mentioned. Yeah, and, like, you could even make that argument, too. Uh, you, you think about a 5-3 a province split. Like, you can make that up with something like a fairgrounds or, like, a distant lands or maybe some orchard points or something. Yeah. Like, it's feasible to, to make up a province split that way. But, like, a... Uh, a 5-3 colony split, that's a difference of 20 points. When was the last time you scored 20 points on Orchard? Or, like, you got 20 points worth of fairgrounds or something. <laughs> it's harder to do. It is hard, yeah. So, like, that's not to say you don't get those things in a colony game. It's to say that they don't matter as much as getting colonies the way that yeah. they might matter as much as getting a province. And, and for my money, like, if colony's out, 
you are pretty safe just disregarding a lot of other sources of VP. And there are exceptions, yeah. of course, but Colony is just so many points that it just kind of craps all over them. And, and that's really the biggest draw for me away from playing in Colony in every game, because it invalidates a lot of other different ways to win the game yeah, sure. by scoring points in different ways. I, I like that's cool. I really like the idea that I play with Colonies sometimes. Yeah. That's that's where I that's the sweet spot I want to keep it at. Yeah. Is that colonies may or may not come up. Colonies are <laughs> like cookies. It's a sometimes food. Exactly. Yeah. They're like uh, really really big cookies. Yeah. That make the other cookies less appealing. Yeah. Yeah. There's I mean there's a great meme we can make with the colony art cookie. Sure. It's gonna happen. Probably I'm the sure thumbnail for this episode. Just so you know, like if you're not a video listener, like that's great, and I'm really glad, and you are actually our target audience. But like we have these little nuggets on our video <laughs> podcasts, yeah. and uh, sometimes just you know, just just know that they're there. Yeah, no, it's important. I like memes. Remember, if you ignore memes, you're just gonna lose games of Dominion. This is true. Yeah. Um, sometimes if you are a meme, you're gonna lose games of Dominion. No, but also uh, true. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we t we talked a little bit about how we were going to get into points on dominate. Yeah. Uh, with these colony games, dominate is a fourteen cost event from the Empire's expansion. It says gain a province. If you do, get nine VP tokens. I think that it's safe to say that everything we've said so pretty much everything we've said so far about colony also applies to dominate because it's yeah. also this big. Uh, scale this big source of VP that outscales most other things. Yeah, uh, it's it's different though in that for two reasons. Uh, one of them is that taking a is that the you you still have this one game ending pile which is the provinces and taking a dominate uh, takes a province out of that pile, whereas like taking a colony doesn't take a province out of the pile or, or what have you so you yeah. have this choice between going for dominates and going primarily for provinces but um but not dominating but yeah but and know that they're that they're eating out of the same pile yeah so there's a i mean the math just gets a little bit different fortunately um on making luck a dominion podcast uh we're pretty good at math as long as it doesn't involve counting right and when it does involve counting, if I have a calculator or a spreadsheet, I'm usually okay. So, um, if you have two dominates, it's the same number of points as five provinces. I yeah. think this is a really good starting point because it's the same number of points, and uh, you know that's seven provinces. And in a two-player game, that's most of the province stack. It makes it really clear to see who is ahead and who is behind. Because if I have three dominates, I'm way ahead of the curve, and yes. they're five provinces. They're just totally boned. So they're going to need to dominate to get points. Well, this is assuming that your opponent is uh, just going for provinces and buying them, and you've been able to dominate. And the yeah. inside, and that just doesn't really work very well in practice. Is I mean, uh, it, kind of the insight you take away from this because yeah, that's what you're up against. Yeah, I have to get six provinces before they can dominate twice effectively. Now, again, we come back to that. Uh, point we made about the colonies about how the provinces are an easier pile to empty than the prov than the colonies. It's much easier to buy a province than it is to buy a dominate. By so a lot, yeah. If it is uh, much much more feasible to get provinces, then maybe take many more turns to build this deck that might dominate someday. Sometimes it's sometimes you can get to that mark of getting six or six provinces before they can dominate and. Yeah, that'd be fine. So, so a little more on this in a second, but uh, just I, I want to point out that um, the dominate deck, even even with two dominates versus five provinces, the dominate deck is a much much better deck at this point. Yeah. So even if I only have one dominate, if I know I'm going to get one soon, um, my deck is way better because it's only going to have two green cards in it instead of five. And yeah. also, I've put I've taken more time to put better cards in the deck. Because I had to hit 14, I had to build a little more. Yeah. So my deck is much, much better. And if this is anywhere close to two dominates versus five provinces, then the dominate player is still at a pretty massive advantage. Yeah, if you are ever on the fence as to whether or not the dominates are viable, you should probably go for them. Because if you remember, you only need to get the two to just invalidate five turns worth of uh, province building that you would have done otherwise. Yeah, you don't need to be sustainable, really. Yeah. I mean, if you just, like, 
get three Mad Men or something, get some one shots sure. or, or like apprentice some big cards, and then just have a couple of big turns, even though your deck isn't sustainable. Like, yeah, that can still be a valid path to victory. If I mean, I guess typically you're aiming towards three dominates there, because then your advantage of having a better deck is lessened. But uh, it's still pretty good because it's so many freaking points. Uh, yeah. Now, the there's another uh, big difference between Colony and Dominate. Yeah. Uh, that maybe you want to get into a little bit. Yeah, so Colony has Platinum there. Yeah. In every that's... game with no Kingdom support, I can hit 11 because Platinum's there. Yes. And Col like Dominate just doesn't have that baked-in way to hit 14. You have to look for support from the kingdom. Now, boy, howdy, I can buy five golds, and I can draw my five golds and hit $15. I don't need your kingdom for that, Billy Joe. So Adam was talking about buying golds, and uh, he said that it, you could theoretically buy five golds. Boy, and, howdy. And draw all of them and maybe dominate that way. But I think the point he's trying to make is that that's really unlikely. Yeah, I usually use that voice when I'm... Um, talking about something that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, don't plan on that. Yeah. Uh, you need something else. And I think uh, what you need is some kind of plus cards. Yeah, without... The, the big thing on a colony board is uh, being able to increase your hand size. Hitting 14 on a five-card hand is just really unrealistic almost all the time. So, I said plus cards, and Jake said increase hand size, which is something that we call draw, right? Yeah, we uh, did talk I about wanna, two different things. I want to lessen the requirements here, because um, there's there's something commonly referred to as terminal draw, right? Yeah. Where you, you just play a smithy and you have no actions left and yeah. sure you can hit 14 that way and that's a lot more viable that could possibly work and then there's also um cantrips yes where you uh keep your hand size the same but uh if i'm playing 10 peddlers and then yeah um, 14 gets a lot more reasonable it's just plus card even though it's not draw but you're, you have plus cards, and so cantrips can work for this. Sure. This is assuming that these are value cantrips, right? This is assuming that these are cantrips that are, that, are, that are actually giving you money. So, And it, we've talked before about how when there is no way to properly increase your hand size on a kingdom, uh, some of the focus does shift to getting value from cantrips because yep. you can increase uh, the value of your turn that way. Uh, and so the cantrips uh, do it, but the... Increased hand size is usually a much more viable and consistent way to do it. Uh, well, yeah, drawing a lot of cards is super great, and yeah. drawing your whole deck is super great. And that's way better than the stuff that I said, but the if you, all you have is cantrips and terminal draw, you can dominate, and you probably should go for that. Yeah, the other notable characteristics of uh, dominate are, when, are that you could trash the provinces. Yeah. You lose less than half of the VP that you got from it by trashing the province after dominating, uh, which comes up a lot when you talk about that uh, fabled Rats Dominate training deck <laughs> that we talked about in the Rats... By the way, that's not a good deck, but um, the, that we talked about in the Rats episode. Like, uh, You can also get into like trash for benefit shenanigans and things like that, but... But I'm really looking at points. Sure. I mean, so, trashing provinces is a marginal tag. It's a niche Bishop tactic. and ritual. Yeah. Or maybe, like, uh, getting another dominate? So, like, I'm really looking at VP tokens, but getting another dominate is pretty sus. Yeah, sure. I mean, like, uh, you think about something like Salvager, uh, that's pretty good for it, but... Yeah, but, like, uh, you're just not scoring nearly as many points because you have to trash six points to get 15, so you're netting nine. This is fine, but I would really rather be salvaging, like, a gold or something. Something else that's expensive that doesn't lose me points. Because points are yeah. super great. Yeah, they are. If I'm going to trash a province, I'm usually trying to mill the province to end the game. So I'm, I'm really starting to think about, like, well, now I have a bunch of money in two buys. Do I want to be getting two provinces without dominating as opposed to a dominate in a province? And if you're ahead in points, you know, do that. Don't just dominate because you can, right? If you want to end the game, go do that. Yeah, yeah. You get into some interesting considerations when you, like, maybe hit $16 in two buys and you're thinking about getting two provinces or one dominate. Uh and it, yeah, if the game is, if it's close, if you could end the game this turn or next on a lead, uh, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe you take the two provinces. Yeah. So, 
yeah, that's uh, mostly we talked about Colony Platinum, and we got into a little bit of Dominate, which has a lot of the same considerations, mm -hmm. and now we're going to talk about a kingdom, which is definitely going to force in Colony Platinum, Yeah, uh, and we're going to be playing that and talking about our strategies. For sure. So uh, I'll go ahead and read the cards in this kingdom, and then I'll give a little bit of commentary about it. So uh, we have Lighthouse, Warehouse, <laughs> Armory, Nomad Camp, City, Mint, Goons, Grand Market, Hunting Grounds, Expand, and of course Platinum and Colony. One more time for our audio-only listeners. Lighthouse, Warehouse, Armory House, just Armory, Nomad Camp, City, Mint, Goons, Grand Market, Hunting Grounds, Expand, with Platinum and Colony. Yeah, so this is interesting. I don't know for a fact that you will ever actually get a colony here. Or I'm pretty sure colony is super important. And, and you're probably, it's you're probably talking about goons, right? It's important that it's there, but like this game is going to end on a three pile, like no question. This is going to end on a three pile. Don't you tell me what, what I'm going to do. I can tell you that if you don't do it, I will, and I'll win. But, because... You don't even know. No, that's... You can't say that. I am saying that. I say this game is going to end on a three pile. Because you can... I mean, like, if if you this start... Guy. Okay, so, like, there are two options. One is that both players... Keep, you have, like, no cap on the potential that you can build to here. Like, there, there's always some way to really be improving your deck, uh, whether that's thinning or getting another city slash hunting grounds, maybe getting an expand. Uh, Goons is obviously great. But, uh, like, you can either start greening at a certain point and stop getting that, like, exponential increase to the expected value of your turns uh, and let your opponent just keep on building this amazingly better deck than yours. Or you can... Uh, just keep building forever until there's a three pile threat, and then end the game on a three pile. And I think both players are just going to be building until the game ends. So uh, a couple things. First of all, like you said exponential growth. Okay, exponential growth is, is technically wrong. Not exponential. It is quadratic at best, and that is a huge, huge difference. I use the term exponential colloquially. By colloquially, you mean just wrongly yes, right correct okay That's great what colloquially tends to mean okay yeah um <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of it that way yeah but but anyway um you you, you need to have a points lead if you're going to end the game on points and colonies are a lot of points now um i'm not saying that you don't also go for goons right there's goons is a lot of points yeah and it's one of the very very few sources of points that can compete with colony in terms of just magnitude of points you can score right this is true. So if I let you get... I mean, there's city and goons, right? If I let you get all the cities and all the goons, you're going to play seven goons. It doesn't matter how many colonies I have because you can score that many points just with goons, right? You so can't you're, let you do that. You're not wrong about that, but one pile is going to be low. Uh, cities are going to be out. and One pile is going to be low. A pile is going to be low. So we're going to get to this point before then that a pile is going to be low. Cities are going to be gone or low. It's And... Uh, expands and hunting grounds are going to be floating around in the deck. I'm just really not convinced that a pile is going to be low. And at a certain point, we are... Uh, well, and you're going to have a gazillion buys, too. I, so you can get to this point where you can three-pile with uh, at least hunting grounds. At the very least, you could trash hunting grounds into, uh, you know, uh, probably province, state, a state, a state. Only if you're ending the game. Uh, but, like, I don't think that... The three pile is going to take too long to set up, and I think you're going to win the game on that before any of this other stuff matters. Now, if your opponent uh, ducks and gets panic points, well, then you can sort of shift your tactics, but... Yeah, man, you're gonna I, have to shift your tactics. I don't think that it's a good idea for the opponent to do that, because I think you're still in a much... Because they made their deck worse, and you didn't. And... They're, you're in like similar places other than that. I don't think this game's going to end on colonies. I mean, I'm not going to tell you how the game is going to end because I don't know what both players are going to do. I think the deck you're talking about is a lot slower to build than what you're selling it as. It's like 
by turn four, you're off the ground, and you've got four goons in the deck, and you've got all the cities. Okay, great. So, uh... I'm not saying you don't go for goons. I'm not saying you don't go for city. I'm not saying you don't go for grand market and hunting grounds and build this bigger deck. Uh, what I am saying is that colony is a lot of points and it's going to matter. And I don't know how the game is going to end because I haven't seen the way it played out. I think it's very, very likely that neither player ever gets a colony. Uh, well, definitely that's that's no good. Like at some point. Okay, well, we'll find out. I, I really don't think this matters at all. Like, this... I don't even care. So, like, I'm not even willing to die on this cross. I wanted to say a couple things about this kingdom. Sure. Uh, this is a design kingdom. Yeah. Uh, it was submitted to us by a new listener of the podcast, Hebra. Uh, it's uh, the gentleman who organizes uh, the tournaments in Michigan, the, the one that I, I went to recently. Uh, I actually played this board. Uh, you can stack your opening... Um, after stacking my opening and getting a Nomad Camp and a couple Lighthouses in the deck, I got really lucky and woke up with five Coppers on turn three, got myself a Mint, and I ran away with it, so I think that's by far the best strategy. Is to get really lucky. Yeah, it's to get really lucky. Um, uh, remember, as we always say here on Making Luck, a Dominion podcast, uh, if your strategy is to get lucky, that's the best possible thing, and you should do that all the time. That's true. Yep. That's yeah, what so what, in all seriousness, what do you think you open here? Uh, I think like you, you want to get a big mint off early, but I wonder if maybe you open a lighthouse, lighthouse, and possibly get a hunting grounds really early to try to get a big mint as quickly as you can. So I like the idea, but nomad camp just seems like a better opening for that purpose. Are you going to? Yeah, but then you've got. Well, okay. Yeah. I want a Nomad Camp, and I want a Lighthouse. So if I open with Does four better, on turn it? one, I'm getting a Nomad Camp. And I'm probably just picking up two Lighthouses, even if I hit five. If I have a three, four, I'm getting a Lighthouse, and then I'm getting a Nomad Camp. Like Nomad Camp is a great card for the deck. It's so true. I, I want it super hard. I. Um, but we agree that the, the idea is to get a Hunting Grounds really quickly, right? Uh, well, the, I, unless you get a five Copper Mint. Right? I want an Expand. Really? Okay. Like, if I had seven, I would slam that expand and be very happy about it. Ooh, if I had seven coppers and I had enough econ for this to be viable, I might get a seven I'm copper mint. I'm not talking about seven coppers. Obviously, you get a mint if you trash all seven coppers. You have some econ in your deck. I'm talking about, like, I played some lighthouses. I have a duration lighthouse and a nomad camp and maybe, like, a silver or something. Yeah, and, okay. And the first time I hit six, I happened to hit seven. I'm going to think really hard about an expand. That's the only way to get rid of estates, and that's going to help me set up for a later mint. You're you're not wrong about any of this, and that's all really reasonable. Yeah. I am thinking, my hunch right now is that it's going to be a little bit stronger more of the time to try to get an early hunting ground to set up a big hand for a big mint uh, early on, sure. and then get the expand after that. I mean, that's more um, likely because it's easier to hit six, but I just want to hit... I want to spike big price points, yeah. is what I'm saying. So sure. that's why I'm putting the Nomad Camp in the deck. The Lighthouse is really helpful uh, because, you know, it makes the Goon's Attack hurt less and also it helps you spike the big price points yeah. by having the duration money out. Yeah, I was actually going to say, like, uh, the Lighthouse is, is fine for spiking, but, like, I think the, you, the Lighthouse, uh, the main re the Goon's is the main reason you're getting the Lighthouse on this board. Uh, right. Uh, I would probably be getting Silver's instead of lighthouses if it weren't yeah. for goons. Sure. Yeah, I think that's probably the case. But, I mean, goons is there, and it's a big deal. I want a big hand size if I'm going to make effective use of mint, and uh, lighthouse is going to help me Yeah. because uh, I imagine I'll get attacked by goons. Or once I get lighthouse coverage, then you know I'll be less inclined to get goons against the guy who does that. So what do you think about Grand Market? Uh, it's a fine card. It kind of... I, I think you skip it. I don't know, man. Like, if I'm having trouble drawing my cards and I hit six and I need some payload, maybe I'll get it. Uh, maybe. I mean, okay, so if you need the econ and you're light on terminal space right now, uh, I can see it. You're gonna like, be pretty much the whole game. I need cities, man. Okay. Cities. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. I can see no. worlds where I get it. I yeah, can also sure. see worlds where I don't. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not super confident you never get a grand market i'm gonna say that if you tell me you never get a grand market on this board i'm not gonna be very surprised because you have two other really important cards competing at the six dollar price really point. like the word never 
If you tell me never, I'm not going to be super surprised. To agree with the use of the word never? Yes. <laughs> I didn't say never. I said I might agree with you if you said it. Okay, I appreciate what you're trying to say here, but you just need to smack me in the face if I talk like that to you. Oh, believe me, I get close whenever you do the Appalachian accent. But, um, <laughs> like, the, uh... Or whenever I throw a rock at you. Right, which yeah. Which has been known to happen. This is true. Uh, so... Yeah, I mean, maybe you get a grand market at some point. Yeah, it could happen. But probably never. <laughs> okay, whatever, man. Uh, one last thing about this kingdom before we uh, leave it up to you, the listener. Uh, there is a hidden theme to this kingdom. Uh, it was designed in by the designer. <clears throat> and uh, if you can guess what that is, uh, you'll win the raffle or something, right? Yeah, yeah, and we'll send you a baby. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wanted I wanted to mention that uh, the last time we had where people were guessing what our minisodes were, we had one uh, person guess 55 different minisodes, which I deeply appreciated. Uh, and he, he, got he got one, one. of them. Yeah, <laughs> I uploaded it unlisted. Uh, it's mostly edited, but the 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 content is edited, but the intro and outro aren't there. I yeah. uploaded it, sent it uh, unlisted, sent a link. I'm I'm hoping you're enjoying that episode. Well, actually, minisode. so it's interesting because we kind of don't lose out on any episodes, but like we kind of lose one person. Uh, getting to listen to an episode we're but, still gonna publish that one don't but, worry but the thing is that like he gave us like three ideas for episodes <laughs> too so like we we have new ones we're gonna do now so yeah um, well i mean he gave us 55 ideas but some of them yeah. aren't entirely serious but some of them they're serious, amazing but i think what didn't this come from that didn't this episode come from that list it was probably on that list yeah actually yeah shout outs by yeah. the way so first of all you know shout outs for suggesting us something because we care and we do it but also, I uh, just want to point out that sometimes you actually get the raffle prize. Yeah. You always get the raffle prize. What are you talking about? Sometimes you get the raffle prize. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, let us know what you think this uh, hidden theme is. And if you're right, uh, I don't know, something cool might happen to you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, $10 off at Chipotle. Yep. <laughs> that sounds good. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, as, uh, as I was saying before... If you have thoughts about this kingdom, podcast, anything, uh, let us know. We'd like to hear from you. Uh, you can go to adamhorton.com. There's links to everything. The YouTube channel, the forums, the Discord, all of our contact information. Uh, yes. We'd like to hear from you. Yeah, totally. And uh, also, it was with deep sadness that I want to announce uh, something you told me the other day. The uh, Oreo candy bars. Oh, I yeah. think that those... You guys I haven't seen those in a while, but those Oreo candy bars we were enjoying, um, I believe they may have been discontinued. Yeah. So, so a moment of silence for the Oreo candy bars. Rip in peace, Oreo candy bars. It was too soon. It was. They were pretty good. I know. <sighs> All right. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Thanks for listening. threw a rock at you <laughs> screw off <laughs> i gotta tell you that was my favorite part of our entire experience was throwing a rock at you yeah that was um man let's bring me back to that time when you accidentally started climbing that wall oh yeah you got hit with a rock <laughs> and your head was bleeding yeah that was pretty good yeah it's like i threw a rock at myself right i lost one might and i gained one sanity because that's how that works. Uh, yeah, and your wife lost most of her sanity at that point. Um, <laughs> I guess... It wasn't even that bad. It didn't even hurt. It, like, yeah. itched more than anything. Well, the thing is, like, she didn't feel that part. She just saw the blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of blood, it turns out. Yeah, when you hit yourself in the head with a rock, it tends to be that way. It fell from, like, a good two feet above my head. Yeah. And, like... But you really needed to climb that wall, I guess. And uh... I was having fun until that happened. Yeah, um, even afterward, I felt like you were having fun until, uh, you know, your wife got involved and then said, hey, stop. 
climbing that wall because well yeah you might die. I I think I kept climbing it at that point and <laughs> yeah and then the rock happened and she's like okay now you're really done right I couldn't really argue with that one this is true 